welcome to the Asset Revolution Podcast, where each week, your hosts from Arbor Digital provide educational opportunities for financial advisors and individual investors to gain knowledge in this emerging powerhouse that is digital asset investing. The Asset Revolution Podcast is your connection to the future of digital assets and an opportunity for anyone to get off zero. Let's dive in. Got it. All righty, everybody. Welcome back to the Asset Revolution podcast, where we talk about the evolutionary aspects of digital assets, as well as how they are revolutionizing the traditional world. And today, I'm very excited to bring on a friend and admirer from afar for quite some time, uh, Gerald David from ARCA. And Gerald, I usually don't like to introduce my guests, so please take it away, introduce yourself to the audience. Thanks, Mark. Um, first of all, super excited to be on, on a part of the revolution, um, that's for sure, especially the asset revolution, and thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah, so a little bit about myself, I guess, and then if you're cool with it, let's jump into the ARCA and get to the more fun stuff. Let's do it. Um, I've been, uh, been involved in this space for probably about five or six years now. Um, I was involved in capital markets and traditional finance previously. Um, spent the far majority of my career on the derivative side of the world. Um, worked at NYMEX, worked at CME, founded a couple of exchanges called the Dubai Mercantile Exchange, the Green Exchange, um, both of which were you know, kind of um, specific. One was a carbon exchange in Europe, one was a petroleum exchange in the Middle East. Um, got involved in infrastructure, found my way across to blockchain around 2015, 2016. Um, worked on one of the exchange launches, and then ultimately found my way to the asset manager ARCA, uh, circa 2019, uh, and I've been the president of ARCA Labs since. Wonderful. And maybe if you could, just two things I'd like to dive in there. First is uh, something that the audience tells us that they really enjoy is hearing the stories of why people would make the jump, especially people who has distinguished in the traditional world, and then move into this new world of crypto that could be so volatile, and we don't even know if it's going to be successful. Um, what made you make that jump? What what did you see here that that got you to make that move? Yeah, it's funny. So it, it was a logical evolution for me, and that was only because I made made the you know kind of determination internally that I was going to be moving from infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So when you leave infrastructure, it's kind of like where do you go? So I found fintech, which is the likely next next place to go, only because the things that were happening at that time where the electronification of markets were finalizing, um, options were kind of leaving trading floors and being traded on electronic venues. Um, and I found that to be super interesting because early in my career, I'd worked on a couple of different things that were kind of along those same lines. Um, and then once you start getting involved in fintech, you very quickly you know, have to fall down that rabbit hole. And it very quickly took me to blockchain. And it was funny, the kind of original projects that I was working on weren't so far off from where I had started, right? Um, you know, and the evolution took me right back to the beginning, whereby, you know, kind of we were working on an ETF application. Um, believe it or not, it ended up being the second ETF application that was filed. Um, for Bitcoin coin futures ETF, believe it or not. Um, and in order to create a Bitcoin futures ETF in 2015, 2016, you need to have a Bitcoin futures contract. Mm -hmm. So at that very same time, back to the roots, CME Group was working on the blockchain reference rate um, and putting that together. And that ultimately became the culmination. So kind of was a very big convergence in kind of my career and what I've been doing. But, um, you know, kind of now evolves in, you know, into, you know, the asset manager that we have built and um, working in some projects that are truly fascinating. Absolutely. And thank you for going into that. Uh, it, it lends itself to then to go into because I think uh, if you if you're familiar, we mentioned you guys all the time on on our podcast and previous shows, just because again, a lot of great work that both you Arca Labs and Arca Digital. So sometimes maybe people get a little confused, which which arm is which so maybe give us a brief rundown Arca Labs versus Arca, the fund to help us take us through who, who Arca is. Totally, Mark. So, um, you know, ARCA as a whole has two different divisions. Um, ARCA is an asset manager. Um, we've been investing and innovating in digital assets for almost four years now. Um, actually, I think that, you know, kind of the early employees now are hitting their fourth year anniversary, which is just miraculous and really, really cool. Um, all of our founders and the core team members really came from traditional finance, and we kind of created the company to recreate what we believe to be the best in traditional finance, um, but how we could enhance that using digital assets. And, you know, the general mission of the firm itself is, um, you know, to offer asset management products that meet the compliance, operational, regulatory, uh, and legal standards that you would expect and you would find within the traditional world. Um, we create products that are for sophisticated investors, uh, and the main goal is to create uh, exposure and give exposure to digital assets. Now, that's really on what we consider to be ARCA 
um, you know, kind of the asset management side, but we do also have, um, you know, a division that's called Arca Labs. And Arca Labs is, in my opinion, where I think some of the really cool stuff starts happening. Um, and we- Not biased uh, there at all, right? <laughs> not, not biased at all. <laughs> so our, uh, our mandate is to, um, to innovate, really. And um, we've been focusing on using, you know, the transformative power of blockchain and digital assets as a whole, digital asset security is really just kind of where we started. Um, to create more efficient and more democratized financial systems. Um, we've been leading the effort to build infrastructure, networks, products, um, all for the digital age. Um, and we developed these through a, you know, intense R&D process as well, advisory work, partnerships, um, and really community building. And you know, kind of one of the core things that I hope we get to talk about today, and I believe we're going to, is kind of what we pioneered in July of 2020, um, which is the Blockchain Transfer Fund. And we spent a lot of time working to create an instrument um, under the confines of existing regulatory structures. Um, and um, when we launched that in July of 2020, it was quite groundbreaking only because um, we were the first firm that was, had created a 40 Act fund to issue its shares as digital asset securities. Uh, but since then we've really evolved and we've got a couple of different businesses that we've created um, that we're incubating right now. A bunch of announcements that I wish I could make today, but I can't um, with some of the work that we've been doing, some of the partnerships and folks we've been working with. No, and thank you for going through that and that distinction, helping people connect with ARCA, the firm, and they help set the foundation of what we're going to talk about today, which is, again, this evolution of uh, securities or a pooled investment fund. And we'll, we'll kind of go into uh, the, the evolution of that. But um, it's always good to leave the audience with some teasers. So there's your teaser. You got it a little early. Uh, exactly. It's, it's always with <laughs> the close, though, Mark. <laughs> it's okay. Maybe we'll re rehash it at the end. But yeah, let's let's get into it because again, our our purpose today really is to discuss this evolution of a pooled investment fund. And a lot of you may, uh, and we've JD, you already mentioned kind of investment forty act. And you know, for those listening who may may not understand a lot of that stuff, we're going to go through the history a little bit. So this blockchain transfer fund (BTF), this evolution of what before that was the ETF, and before that was the mutual fund. So Gerald. Take us through it. What was the take us from beginning, and then we'll we'll keep it going from there. Great. So you know, I'm thinking back right now to the beginning, and it, it's kind of cool because we're approaching we're in May and we're approaching July, and July 2020 is when we received our effectiveness from the SEC. Um, but it was two years worth of work before then, um, whereby the entire team, um, you know, kind of uh, had a vision, and the vision itself was, what if we were able to create, um, you know, kind of regulatory instruments? What if we could create products, funds? that people could invest in that really were able to capitalize and leverage all the benefits of blockchain that exist. Mm -hmm. And to date, um, you know, kind of, we haven't really seen that realization with the exception of what we've created uh, at Arca Labs. And I mean that because a lot of the ETFs that we talk about, I mentioned earlier, you know, kind of futures-based ETFs, we think about things like spot ETFs. Well, what we're really talking about within those vehicles are simply, you know, traditional structures mm -hmm. that happen to have within their portfolio digital assets. And that's far different from what it is that we've created um, in the respect that what we're creating really is a digital asset or digital asset security, I should say. So, you know, kind of what was the vision in the very beginning? The vision was, um, you know, to work within the confines of structures that are, you know, commonly accepted and highly regarded, right? And the first thing you have to do is search for a regulator. And in this case, we recognize we were dealing with securities. So the regulator clearly was the SEC, which is, you know, kind of the gold star, star as we know, you know, across all different jurisdictions. Um, and then you've got to start looking through once you decide that you want to be regulated, which is a big thing in this day and age, right? Think about a lot of the different, you know, kind of actions the SEC has taken um, and they're, you know, with reference to, you know, uh, unauthorized, you know, securities um, that may have been issued and different elements that, you know, kind of impact securities law. Um, but we immediately, you know, agreed that and thought that, you know, kind of, um, you know, going under the umbrella of regulation was super important for the structures we were going to be creating. We created an RIA, uh, and then ultimately we started um, looking around at different products we could create. We gravitated very fast to 40 Act products, very, very fast, right? You start looking at things like liquidity, um, you know, commonly accepted, um, you know, regulations, um, you know, kind of really, really deep breath in terms of products that have been offered both in the credit preceding mutual funds and ETFs landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, and also because the constituents we were talking to, large scale banks, you know, asset managers at the time, um, recognized that they needed to have the protections of something. Right. And, you know, kind of the conversations we're having regarding would you touch digital assets back in those days were would you touch a digital asset? And the answer was only if it's registered, uh, only if it's rated. So you've got two paths if you wanted to create an instrument, you know, for those you know, different market participants back then. 
Um, so the 40 Act was clear to us. We approached the regulator and you know, kind of had initial conversations and discussions with them, and they didn't laugh us out of the room. Um, there were you know, points that came up in the initial conversations whereby um, you know, there were some you know, guardrails that were kind of you know, you know, very, very clear. Um, but we did recognize that if we were going to create something um, that generally speaking was within uh, you know, the known structure of the 40 Act, that you know, it's something that we, 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 we could do, and the SEC was open to that. Um, so we went away and spent a lot of time working with our lawyers and spending a lot of money as you do with these different projects yep. um, and created uh, what we thought was a really, really cool first iteration of how you could incorporate real blockchain chain technology into an existing structure. Um, and we went to the SEC and presented to them um, the ARCA US Treasury Fund. Um, and again, we found, you know, kind of a willing uh, regulator to entertain, you know, kind of how blockchain could impact the way that markets were going to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, and we were super encouraged by that. And we spent a lot of time refining the structure. And at the end of the process, what we came out with was a 40 Act was a closed and interval fund, right? So we're offering continuous subscriptions um, and periodic redemptions uh, for any subscriber that wanted to invest in what we created as a portfolio of US treasuries. Um, and that was super important for us. And that portfolio composition is a minimum of 80, a max, excuse me, a minimum of 80% uh, US treasuries and a maximum of 20% cash or other instruments uh, similarly. Um, so that portfolio, uh, generally speaking, uh, is mostly is mostly uh, U.S. Treasuries. But at the end of the day, if you're investing in the fund, what you're getting is a share of the portfolio. And this is where the really cool stuff starts happening, Mark, is that when you start thinking about that process, like how do you get a share of something? How is it digitized, really? Right. Yep. And that's where we worked uh, and assembled, you know, kind of a team of, of, of service members ranging from your you know, fund uh, accounting across to your transfer agency to your fund distributor that all work in concert together that rally around a blockchain-based solution for issuance of these digital asset securities. So you subscribe to a fund, you wire uh, you know, US dollars or ACH after undergoing you know, kind of your AML KYC that you would have to do. When our fund administrator then deems, excuse me, our transfer agent deems that a fund is in, uh, a subscription is in good order, um, we'll then be get a different, you know, back end issuance and transfer of, you know, different those funds that you sent to us. They'll go from a custodian bank across to our distributor bank. Um, in the event that we need to, you know, uh, buy treasuries, the distributor will act on our behalf, and that desk will actually purchase the treasuries on instruction from the fund itself, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes. But the most important thing that happens that upon a, su su a successful subscription is that a uh, digital asset security is generated. And is issued to the wallet of that subscriber. And from our standpoint, that's the beginning of where the beauty starts happening, because then all, all the elements of blockchain begin to kick in. So we're talking about things like you know peer-to-peer -peer transferability, right? Mm -hmm. So think about a world whereby you you know buy an ETF, QQQ, and all of a sudden I've got the ability to send it directly to you. Um, and we're talking about something that's really, really beautiful there, because now we've got you know kind of this really cool ecosystem that's being built that steps takes one step away from how traditional finance evolved. Yeah, absolutely. So there are so many things we can go to and, and I, I appreciate you starting at the beginning because what a lot of people, if you only see headlines and you only uh, are paying attention when you see it pop up in front of you in a reactive way, you wouldn't know that. And all that work that you've been doing with the SEC and behind the scenes and creating the infrastructure, creating the roads, if you will, for us to drive on, um, that's been happening for what, four or five years? previous to now you guys releasing this BTF product. And, you know, I think it was what, February, 2022, um, that the BTF was officially released. The white paper came out, you know, when it, the day it came out, I was, I was reading it and I was diving into it, understanding what the standards were set, how the melding of the traditional side and, and the, and the infrastructure was going to meld with this new infrastructure that you guys are going to operate on. And it's just really fascinating because, a year and a half ago, or two years ago, I should say, when I started having conversations with Arbor Digital um, or Matt Kleski, you know, one of the first things we we talked about was just assets. All traditional assets are going to be tokenized, right? And you know, that's what the future will be. And I think it's going to take us a lot longer than a lot of people would like it to get there. Um, but there, you're going to see these iterations and these things come out, and there's all this work that's going to have to happen before that. So we want to be on the front end of, you know, bringing solutions to clients, but then we also want to understand what's happening behind the scenes to help us make our, our decisions and make good decisions. And that's where, when we saw all the work that y'all were doing, um, it was just a, a no brainer. So um, uh, for us to dive deeper into, you know, what the BTF is. So take us through, because I think it, it's really interesting because when ETS first came on the scene, you know, um, 
it was really scary. ETFs were actually not accepted uh, amongst the investment world. And so do you guys foresee a similar pathway for adoption of something like the BTF um, as like the ETF? But tell us, how, how do you guys see that happening? Totally. So we find total comfort in looking at history and understanding how history will pr predict our future. Total comfort there. A yeah. couple points here that are super interesting. One, um, you know, kind of my, my, my rock, you know, for the most part here is our CEO, who was a co-founder of Wisdom Tree. So he's lived through this evolution um, and he saw, you know, kind of markets and how they deem and dictate, you know, kind of different products and how they can evolve. Mm -hmm. um, so we recognize that we're also very early, right? We're talking about, you know, an evolution of a product um, that, that we refer to as, as a digital asset security, right? And a digital asset security is a subsection of, you know, kind of tokens. When you look at the, to the, the taxonomy of how the industry itself has evolved. So, you know, kind of a very small number of tokens are actually deemed digital asset securities. And by virtue of that, a very small number of the population actually has exposure to that. Yep. So to your point earlier regarding, you know, kind of the future of markets, you know, we conducted a survey with uh, Greenwich and Associates or Coalition Greenwich, I believe is their, their, their branded as now. And 72% of the market participants that we, that we polled believed that uh, all, securities will be deemed digital asset securities within the next five years. And 84% believe that within 10 years, all digital, digital security, all securities will be digital asset securities. So I think that the way that you guys were thinking about it, you know, kind of several years ago is consistent with the way that we had been thinking about it and why we actually started to create these products. Uh, and clearly, you know, kind of the market is rallying around that, whether, you know, kind of they had the foresight, we had the foresight, who knows, but at least the, the collective belief is, is, is uniform at this point. So, you know, in terms of, you know, the way that ETFs evolved, obviously, you know, there were commodity ETFs, you know, index ETFs, um, you know, inverse ETFs that expand that, you know, kind of went across, you know, multiple different asset classes, right? And that was one of the beauty of what ETFs did, right? They, they evolved the structure from the mutual fund, right? And the mutual fund itself, obviously, you know, kind of was a commonly accepted tool, but mutual funds have been around, you know, since, you know, for, you know, 40 or 50 years prior to that. Yep. Um, and there were limitations, right? Mutual funds are bought and sold once a day. Don't forget, um, they were only priced a day based on NAV. Mm -hmm. um, they were typically uh, actively managed, right? So there wasn't a lot of flexibility in what you could do within that wrapper. Um, and um, there were some tax inefficiencies, right? Capital gains and things that, you know, kind of other, there were other problems. And when the ETFs came out, don't forget, you know, kind of they were offering things like, you know, lower expense ratios. Right. They were, you know, offering lower fees. So there's fee compression that you were seeing there. And that was one of the main reasons that fueled the adoption and the growth was that, you know, you could do a lot more with uh, your capital. Um, there were, you know, evolutions in the way that they were looking at structures, right? Security baskets were things that, you know, started, you know, coming into play and so on and so forth. Yep. So, so when we, we, we think about that, there are a couple of different elements, right, that, that you know, have to happen. One, there's got to be broad, broad uh, education right, on why it is that one would invest in these type of tools. And the second was the ability to transfer these things and trade them on exchanges, right, which then began to fuel the growth and allowed for the democratization of those asset classes. Yeah. You know, kind of in our in our, our roadmap, you know, we've got other different triggers that are out there that we think are going to fuel that growth as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the first thing that has to happen um, is going to be regulation, uh, and regulation itself really needs to be standardized uh, across, um, you know, digital asset securities uh, and across digital assets for that matter as well. And we know that's coming. Uh, but in order for us to capitalize on that moment, um, you know, we needed to start the education in 2020, like you said, when we first created the first BTF, because our ambition and our goal is not to have one, right? It's to have a family of these products. And we're very, very busy working on them now, uh, some of them in conjunction with some key partners in the marketplace that, too, want to help drive forward, um, you know, kind of the markets through use of digital assets, blockchain, and other things like that. Yeah. Um, and take us through, um, because you, you've gone over kind of a little bit, too, of what what ETFs help solve the inefficiencies of mutual funds and how and why those got adopted. Uh, take us through what did, and I think there's two, there's two elements to this. There's, there's inefficiencies and problems that are being, that the BTF can help solve on the traditional side. And then there's also inefficiencies and things that can help uh, solve things on the crypto native side, uh, on the full decentralized blockchain side. Um, so I think the BTF fits and both can solve issues in both areas. So I'd like to kind of dive into those two different things. So let's start with the traditional side. So how does this, how does a BTF, what problems does it solve? How does it, how is it more efficient than what an ETF can do? Take us through that. Yeah. So I think that there's one small differentiation that I just want to make right here, right? And there's some terms that I'm throwing around that, that some of the viewers may not be familiar with. And the, 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 the differentiation is really simple. It's that, you know, we've created the ARCA US Treasury Fund. So it's a 40 act closed and interval fund. 
you subscribe to the fund, right? Which is this portfolio of US treasuries uh, and, and cash and cash equivalents. And then you receive a digital asset share. The digital asset share that you receive of that fund is called our coin. So you've got the US Treasury fund and then you've got our coin. And the family of funds that we're creating are called blockchain transferred funds, right? So that just hopefully will help everyone understand when I start throwing out these just <laughs> terms that people may not be familiar with what we're talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so for me, right, you know, the BTF, the structure solves two things right away. It solves for transferability and time. Those are the two things that I think that this structure really solves for, right? So what does that really mean? So the first is the peer-to-peer -peer transferability we mentioned a second ago. It means that you and I can, if we're whitelisted by the transfer agent, right, meaning we've underwent AML KYC, we have the ability to transfer these tokens back and forth between the two of us. If the third person joins the whitelist. We've got a party. Now there's three of us we can send tokens back and forth for. But we start thinking about what that universe looks like, right? And you extend, you know, greater than just you and I, Mark, transferring back and forth. Let's think about firms like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, for example, or Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and JP Morgan. And all of a sudden that they're AML KYC, then they're on the white list. And you start thinking about the transferability component, right? Settlement, collateral management, right? For sure, right? How is it that collateral can be moved from one, you know, centralized entity to another one? And let's say we start adding in the element of time that I mentioned before and start doing it frequently, right? So one of the things that, you know, kind of, I think that large scale finance institutions are concerned with as they should be is risk, right? What is their exposure to other different counterparts that are in the marketplace? Well, the way that the current structures have been set up, if you're dealing with settlement, you obviously have, you know, kind of what people have been talking about for many, many years, which is the risk that's involved between settlement and the actual deliverability of the funds, right? And you hear terms like T plus two, T plus three. Well, that means trade date plus another date, like another number. So if you do a trade on, let's say Friday, right? And your settlement's not for, you know, T plus two, but you've got the weekend and your Monday and your Tuesday, and then you're entering your settlement period. So there, there's risk that enters that. Um, and the risk obviously is that the counterpart goes away, right? There's, there's nothing more, you know, kind of cataclysmic than that. Um, you know, going from something to having nothing. So using blockchain, right, in this scenario, or even let's take about, talk about our coin, right? This digital mm -hmm. asset share, right? This low volatility token. Well, what if you have the ability to transfer our coin from any of these two counterparts back and forth and start doing it on a subfrequent basis of let's say 10, 12, 14 minutes? Well, then you've got the ability really to start, you know, taking, you know, sums of money, capital, moving them from one location to another, one counterpart to another, uh, and at the same time satisfying an obligation, yet mitigating the risk that you would have if you had to wait a good 72 hours or more mm -hmm. in order to satisfy an obligation. So from my standpoint, if you know you could use uh, you know, you know, uh, digital asset security under the 40 Act, a la the BTF, um, it's really something special and allows for a lot of different you know kind of use cases um, and a lot of different problems that others are trying to solve within banking infrastructure. Like I said collateral man management, treasury management, and other different elements within um, you know large FIs. Yeah, and I, the use cases are going to evolve so quickly when when you start to see, when people are starting to use these types of vehicles and these types of wrappers and these this these evolutionary uh, technologies, um, you're going to start to see even new use cases come about. And I, I, please, this isn't even, this is all done within the US right now, right? Like, so this fund, because it's regulated the way it is, it can only operate in, in US, correct? That's right. So right now the fund only allows for US-based subscribers. Mm. Um, and we're working on a few different use cases in other jurisdictions, whereby we're having active conversations with other regulators um, in order for us to allow for uh, individuals or corporates that reside within those jurisdictions to subscribe to the fund. That's amazing. Um, because yeah, the, a, a future iteration of this type of wrapper will hopefully be one, because I think that's something that brings in is this efficiency at operating globally at on a global scale right um and it's hard not to see that type of future when you just start interacting with with the btf um and our coin and and how everything works with the wallets and peer-to-peer -peer. um so take us through now maybe what what is missing on the full-on crypto native side that maybe the btf can come in and be a solution for have you guys thought about that how do, how do you guys see that fitting in with that crowd Totally. So there's um, there's one element that we've been working on um, for the BTF wrapper, um, and the one element that we're working on right now um, in conjunction, um, you know, kind of with, with you know, outside third parties, is how is that our coin can be traded on digital asset securities ATSs. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, you know, that's the kind of the the uh, um, last piece of the puzzle for us in terms of liquidity, 
and allowing for us to allow for peer-to-peer -peer transferability, listen on some of the digital asset securities, ATSs that are out there in the marketplace right now, allow for, in some cases, 24 seven tradability of the asset, um, which allows for you to satisfy you know, requirements that you may have at any given time. So from our standpoint, you know, Connor, there's a couple of different, you know, um, elements of the structure that we tweaked. So the mm -hmm. first of which was that, you know, ultimately before, um, when we, grant, we were granted our effectiveness originally, um, we allowed for redemptions, but our redemptions were quarterly. We've contracted that now down to a monthly cycle. Yeah. Um, which basically means that you can redeem from the fund on a monthly basis. We've got a full on process that's managed by our, 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 our operations team. Um, and, uh, you know, you, can, you respond to a notice and you get your, you know, funds back wired to, uh, you know, your bank account at some point in the future. The other was, you know, kind of on-ramps and off-ramps. Uh, we now have the ability to allow for subscriptions through Signet, right? Uh, and then kind of, you know, the last piece of it is going to be allowed for us to have, you know, trading on ATSs. So once we get there, I think that we've got, you know, commercial viability for the product in a way that, you know, kind of we had set out to achieve, probably on a shorter time frame than we had. Yeah. Um, and then you start talking about, like, you know, kind of like you said, where is it that it fits in within infrastructure, right? And a great example would be, you know, a POC um, that the folks at Symbian um, are putting together right now, where, whereby they're utilizing Arcor, right? And what they're doing is, um, is creating a pilot um, that is the second phase of a pilot they conducted last summer. And they had five large scale, you know, banks and asset managers. Um, they negotiated all of their ISDAs all of their agreements, all of their market data through indexes and settlement was, was done on chain for an FX forward trade, right? Mm -hmm. And the FX forward trade and settlement movements were conducted on a 30 day basis. But the one thing that the parties couldn't agree upon or a tool that they didn't have at their disposal was a digital asset or a digital asset security that was acceptable to all parties, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then also could be blockchain based and delivered. Mm -hmm. So for that trade, weirdly enough, settlement was happening off chain which is like wholly in, unintuitive to yeah. most, only because that's where the most risk, as I mentioned earlier, that's where the most risk resides. Mm -hmm. So phase two of this transaction will be to start settling the trade on a 10 minute frequency basis, which um, mitigates the counterparty credit risk by over 80%. Wow. So it drops down your capital that you've got to actually transfer and reduces your risk. So that's a great example of a use case for something like Arcoin. Uh, this low volatility token that's created through, you know, through subscribing to this U.S. Treasury fund that we created, mm -hmm. and then ultimately can be used as a real in a real world application. And we're working on another UK use case down in Bermuda for that, and several others that, um, you know, kind of hopefully we'll be able to um, announce and talk about, you know, in the future. I did it again, Mark. I should have yeah. saved it for the end. <laughs> You're good at the teasing, JD. We, 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 we've established that. Um, so, okay. So again, but not good at timing. That's okay. That's okay. Frequently, <laughs> you're you're going for frequency here. Um, so let's let's help people wrap their minds around this because uh, one of the things that I think a lot of people find value in what we've received as feedback is really helping people understand kind of the differences because I think one of the the issues that in this industry that we see just with, with you know educating is that everyone finds these terms and these definitions and they, they then apply everything to that. So I think cryptocurrency uh, is still out there as everyone just sees cryptocurrency as this one thing and everything falls underneath the cryptocurrency. But what I love that the BTF does very eloquently is help understand the difference between like a security token versus a, a different type of token standard. And so we, we've done a lot of work there to help people understand those through different standards. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people connect with the example of the internet, you know, when the internet was first being born, there was different protocols and different standards that were trying to be adopted. Like we didn't just end up with, with TCP IP, we didn't just end up with the email standards that we all know and love today. Um, it took a lot of work on the back end. You just never saw it. No one ever talked about, you know, the developers who were, who were doing all that work. And that's a key difference here in these markets with these assets. You have all this work happening, developing these different types of tokens, these different types of standards, and it's not universally recognized. Not everyone is using the same thing yet. And that's where it's, it gets exciting, but also it's, it's so hard to wrap your head around. So maybe help us differentiate our coin as a, as a digital asset security. What does that mean? How does it differentiate from these other um, assets or tokens? That's right. I think that's a really good point, Mark. And thanks for bringing that up, right? So, you know, there are digital asset securities and digital asset securities, you know, generally speaking, um, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, um, you know, have some sort of a regulatory overhang associated with them, mm -hmm. right? So the RPUS Treasury Fund, as I alluded to earlier, was created 
um, and registered uh, with the SEC. Uh, we want effective, um, you know, kind of, which is basically the way of the SEC saying, um, you know, you can offer this product uh, for outside investment. And when we did that, we thought long and hard about what the attributes were and what the features we needed to have within that structure, right? And what was peer-to-peer -peer transability I mentioned before? Um, one of was immutability, super important, right? Um, traceability, right? You know, the transparent nature and, you know, kind of the inherent, you know, we developed on you know, the Ethereum blockchain, the inherent ability to go ahead and understand and trace backwards, you know, kind of what happened and what's happening, you know, with the digital asset uh, security as well. Um, but the most important thing were the enhanced security features that we thought um, we could, you know, implement as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think that, you know, causes apprehension from, you know, folks that are new to the space. Um, and when I say folks that are new to the space, I would also say that like institutions that are new to this space, mm -hmm. right? Um, what are their concerns? Well, AML, AML KYC uh, and custody and uh, risk of the asset. And by risk of the asset, I don't mean necessarily, um, you know, the fact that, you know, kind of it's got high volatility, right? Um, because that's, you know, kind of inherent to markets, right, that we're talking about that are freely traded. Um, but we're talking about things like, you know, how is it that, um, you know, kind of if I have a ledger in the pocket of my, you know, chief investment officer, and he's commuting back to New Jersey and his New York waterway ferry, you know, kind of sinks, uh, what happens to, you know, kind of the treasury of that institution? Mm -hmm. You know, and if we're dealing with something like Bitcoin, well, we've all, like, read and seen the articles of, you know, some guy who's, you know, you know, digging for his, his treasure in, you know, some sort of a, uh, you know, kind of uh, garbage fill, landfill or whatever mm -hmm. it is, right? Because he's got $20 million that's lost and he wants it back. Well, that's like a real risk that people have. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you can do with the digital asset security um, is the programmability of the smart contract is utilizing um, a couple of different protocols that are out there. Of course, you know, four is one standard that's out there. Another is called the DS protocol. The DS protocol is proprietary to a company called Securitize, happens to be our transfer agent. Okay. And um, that protocol is super interesting to us um, and was something that, you know, kind of was important for us um, to uh, incorporate as a um, enhanced security feature mm -hmm. for uh, any shareholder of the fund. And what we're talking about here really is the ability for someone to lose their digital asset security create an affidavit, go to the transfer agent, say, I lost it, my house burned down, my paper went in the gutter, I was dumb, I forgot my password, whatever it might be, um, prove you're the, who you say you are. You've been AML KYC previously, mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately have the transfer agent, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, investigate, and then uh, given no foul, foul, um, you know, kind of foul play, have the ability then to reissue that digital asset security to the wallet that you provide back to the transfer agent. So this is super cool now, because what we've also done here is that through using this DS protocol, we're allowing for, I don't want to say security of supply, but if you have something and you lose it, it can be replaced. And then what happens to the original uh, token? What happens to the original issuance? They'll burn that. So we'll burn that token and then reissue an equal number of our coin to that uh, authenticated subscriber again. Okay, wonderful. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we talk a lot about the fragility of digital assets. The funny thing is the most fragile point of digital assets is the human. <laughs> um, so this actually, it seems to me, helps solve that for that fragility as well. Um, which again, is another type of risk that, you know, doesn't get talked about a lot, but is very, very important. Um, it's, it's very important, Mark, and I would say it's so important that it comes up so often um, with, you know, folks that are trying to think about what, it, if you think, think about the role you've got, right, and what you've got to do. If you're sitting in the seat at, like, insert bank name here, mm -hmm. and your job is to try to evangelize digital assets within the bank, and every single time you try to say, okay, fine, I think that we should offer, you know, these to our clients, or we should allow for internal trading, you've got to go up against a compliance committee and a risk committee and a management that's saying, okay, fine, so what you're telling me is that materially, if somehow someone loses something or there's a glitch in the matrix, then all of a sudden we're going to have a material, we could potentially have a material loss that might have to be, um, you know, discussed on an earnings call. Mm -hmm. That job's really, really hard. But if you start laying in some of these enhanced security features that allow to reduce the friction, mm -hmm. right, it'll help to spur wider and faster adoption especially within the large scale financial institutions, which I think a lot of people are waiting for and looking to in order for, um, you know, greater, um, you know, accessibility, 
an adoption of digital assets to happen? Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest things where we continue to strive for is this, these enhanced security type features. And the only, the only solution we've been able to, to do is pretty much just blocking access, right? So I think one of the biggest things that for our clients who come to us, they're, they're very concerned, you know, I just, I read about this hack and this thing of a wallet and all this, and I'm afraid of losing, losing my assets. Well, one of the things that we can do from a, from an infrastructure standpoint is just block access. So no matter if your account gets hacked or whatever, but that's not a very elegant solution <laughs> for, for that type of problem. So when we, when I was reading the white paper about what was in the protocol itself, the standard at which the token R coin is built upon on, on top of Ethereum, this was one of the key pieces. Yeah, that's right, Mark. And what you're talking about, or, or what we've been talking about you know, here is you know, what happens if there's a problem, right? Yep. But I think the other thing that's really important is that you know, through our AML and KYC that's mandated, right? In order to subscribe to the fund, we're also trying to weed out bad actors mm -hmm. who ultimately you know, may, for whatever reason, Right, you know, not uh, not pass, you know, uh, a, a KYC AML, um, and that's also very very important too, right? Because you're thinking about how it is that you you know protect your institution, mm -hmm. you know, from folks that you're not supposed to be trading with for whatever reason it might be, Absolutely. or from folks that you're not supposed to be buying from, whether it be sanctions or what have you, OFAC or other. So. Take us through that then. So I think we've talked a lot about some of these new features, these new things. How do you get that? So whitelist, whitelisting is one thing. Take us through what blockchain do you guys trade on? Like what, what is it Ethereum? Is it Solana? Um, what's, what's it currently? What's the future like? So what does that all look and feel like? Totally. So uh, we developed originally on Ethereum. Okay. Um, so ERC-20 token. Um, and we did that, don't forget, dating back to three years ago, really. That was when we made the call on what blockchain we were gonna develop on. Um, so the number, number of the blockchains you mentioned um, weren't options for us at the time. Either A, they weren't even, hadn't, they hadn't been created yet or publicized. Two, they didn't really have a track record um, yet. And you know, kind of we were thinking about it. Um, and obviously, you know, kind of there's been just a tremendous amount of development over the course of the past few years, which increased the number of options that we would have for any other fund that we you know, issue moving forward. So we like to think that we're blockchain agnostic. Um, and I think that there are incentives for us uh, to develop on, you know, for future iterations of the BTF on different blockchains, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a catch-22 for us because at the end of the day, you know, one of the reasons why Ethereum is such an attractive candidate is because the infrastructure around that blockchain is so well established and developed, mm -hmm. right? There's custody solutions that are around that, you know, kind of um, ultimately allow for, you know, broader distribution of the assets. There's a general familiar familiarity with Ethereum. It's, it's been around for a longer period of time, which allows for a level of comfort historically um, for folks that are evaluating what blockchain they can either participate um, on uh, or ultimately um, are going to create upon. So, you know, um, from our standpoint, moving forward, but there's also challenges, right? Yeah. And what are the challenges? Well, the well known one is gas and the cost of that gas. Case. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're as associate, so if you're talking about a blockchain based solution that every single time you subscribe to a fund, or there's a movement that requires, um, you know, an equal movement on chain, there's going to be a cost associated with it. So, you know, there are ways that we can mitigate those costs, obviously. But if we're, we're talking about, you know, Symbian and the POC that I mentioned earlier, well, that's a private permission blockchain known as assembly. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to figure out how we're going to deploy our coin onto, onto assembly. And those conversations, obviously, are well underway. But, you know, moving forward, um, I think that there's a ton of opportunity for us. Um, you know, obviously, you know, kind of many of the different um, names you mentioned before and others have come to us. There's incentives in order to develop on these different, um, you know, uh, layer one solutions. And from our standpoint, you know, kind of we want to develop uh, on a blockchain that has broad basis, broad base access and allows for greater uh, liquidity for us and for any of our shareholders. Um, and that's generally what the calculus looks like for us. Wonderful. Um, I, if, if you're listening, I, I know there's a lot being thrown at, but I hope you're making the connections to where, how can, how can this live and breathe in the world we live in today? And then how, what could this could possibly be in the, in the future world that we live in five to 10 years from now? Because I know when I listen to things or when we're doing our research and we're doing our due diligence on things like this, it's, it's, it's hard not to be able to see. And like, once you open up your mind, it's hard not to see what is coming and these first iteration products like the BTF are, are so important. So um, we've gone over differences between our coin, 
you know, I hope, I hope if you're listening, you can now distinguish between our coin and Bitcoin. It's not it's very different, not the same thing. So JD, take us through future. Um, we've got what we have today. You've mentioned now we want to be blockchain agnostic. So take us further into that. What's the future look like for our coin for the BTF? Yeah. So, um, you know, kind of, it's always been our ambition to have a family of product, right? Um, similarly to how the ETF has evolved as well. When you think about what digital asset securities are, you've got multiple different things um, that you could put into that wrapper, right? You can use real estate, a real world, you know, asset, a car is an example, um, a share certificate um, or stock is another great example as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are motivating factors for each of these different verticals that I mentioned and others that are out there as well. Um, you know, we, we went down the path, um, you know, with one of our venture partners regarding how is it that we could, you know, create vehicles that have in that wallet, excuse me, in that portfolio have like equities, for example, right? Um, and I think that there are some challenges right now to creating those products. And I think the biggest challenge is, you know, kind of access to markets, right? So if you're going to create these products, we're going to trade them on ATSs, hopefully, um, you know, kind of who has access to these different products that are out there, right? And access is determined, obviously, by you know, a variety of different things. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we're really talking about are, you know, kind of, um, you know, what are the rules that are in place and what do they look like and who could actually hold digital asset securities, right? And I think that there is, you know, some cleanup that needs to happen with reference to broker dealers or individuals or who it is that can actually, you know, custody or hold digital asset securities, right? And I think that once we get, uh, you know, past that, I think we'll have the ability to roll out what I would say is gonna be a family of products that are gonna be broadly accessible to a lot of different people that are out there right now um, and satisfy, um, you know, investment opportunities that they otherwise can't get, right? Is it yield generating that you're, you're after? Okay, fine. Well, you know, we could have a solution for that. Um, you know, kind of, are you looking for a digital twin, right? So it's a secondary product um, that, you know, kind of could exist currently, but we want to put that into a digital format, right? And that could happen in a variety of places. That could happen at a private bank, right? For their own clients of the bank, because they want to offer them, you know, digital asset securities and products that others don't have. It can happen on a broader base, um, whereby that's, you know, open to, you know, larger uh, market participants um, and offered through different distribution channels. Um, I fall back on what I said before, Mark, you know, kind of about, you know, the question of, well, most securities be digitized and settled on blockchain, you know, within the next couple of years. Um, and, you know, kind of if that thesis holds true, then what we're really talking about is that every single security that's out there will be a digital asset security. Mm -hmm. So you can think about, you know, I said real estate and corporate stock. Well, think about every other security that's out there and think about what that could look like in a digitized format. Um, and think about if you want to have the additional protections we talked about earlier. Um, or I shouldn't say protections, but the initial in, in, in features, you know, kind of above the BTF, then you're going to find yourself in an entirely different place. And you're going to recognize that, you know, the, the TAM we're talking about here is essentially, you know, capital markets and finance. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Thank you for taking us through that. And it's, it's hard. I hope if you're listening now, you're, you're getting a little energized by maybe the work that's happening behind the scenes. And that's where I think uh, that's a theme we like to bring on guests who are, who are doing that work. And it's clear that you, the rest of the team at ARCA are doing such amazing work, robust, in-depth and taking it all the right ways, especially when you look at what's happening, you know, in the decentralized community, you know, uh, you know, DeFi and all that, you know, a lot of people are kind of just running first and then asking for forgiveness later. You know, the approach that you all are taking is really this measured, disciplined, responsible approach. Hey, let's let's set this up the right way from the beginning in terms of, you know, having security features, uh, regulation, um, working with the SEC and, and these people who are going to eventually have oversight over these types of products that we are building. And then we'll meet we'll meet that somewhere in the middle. Um, so I know I, as admirers and as connectors, you know, over the last two to three years, um, I, will, I just want to thank you for all the work that you guys are all doing. And if there's anything else that we miss, I wanted to leave the last few minutes we have here. Is there anything else you would mention about the BTF, how it's revolutionary or any other work that y'all are doing over at ARCA? Yeah, I, um, you know, kind of, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, I think the one thing that if there's anyone to leave, you know, kind of your, uh, you know, your listeners with. Um, is that the opportunity is great, right? And, you know, when we talk about the benefits of tokenization, you know, we talk about things like lower costs, faster settlement, 
the ability for programmability, whether it's you know, DS protocol or others, the immutable proof of ownership, um, liquidity through trading on ATSs or peer to peer trading, uh, and even things like fractional ownership. And, you know, kind of if you subscribe to any of those, um, you know, benefits, benefits of tokenization, um, then at the end of the day, what we're talking about here really are digital asset securities. And I think it's important that, you know, kind of market participants begin to understand um, you know, the difference between regular, um, you know, I don't want to call them regular digital assets, but something that, you know, kind of would be, you know, Solana or Bitcoin or, you know, any of the other different names that are out there versus something that's a digital asset security, which inherently has, you know, some of these other different elements that we've talked about today. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a world where we talk, where just people are going to start talking about our coin right there. Um, so, we're going to link the white paper to the blockchain transferred fund uh, in That's the right in the show right. notes. Um, you y'all did a webinar as well. I think you you were with Rain, who's you know, over there over at Arca as well. You guys did a full on webinar. Um, so we'll put the link in the show notes to that to really hear you guys have a really in depth conversation more on the a lot about the technicalities of it as well, how it works. Which uh, you know a lot of, we talked a lot of high level today, so. That would be a great reputation. But JD, anything else you would point people to? How do they find you? Give, give the audience there. Yeah, um, you could find us at arcalabs.com. Um, and the other thing I recommend, Mark, that we put on uh, as a tag uh, once you've you know, finalized the podcast is maybe we could put a tag to the prospectus as well. So if anyone's interested in actually seeing our SEC filing, um, we could allow you access to that and you can see that on Edgar. And we'll drop that link um, you know, collectively. I'll get that to you and we could add that too. Absolutely. You got it. Um, well, we'll add that. And JD, I'm going to end this by saying again, thank you so much for taking the time and energy today with us at Arbor Digital. Thank you for all the work that, that you're doing and bringing to the world. It's a big responsibility. Um, and especially given your background uh, and you that you've come into this space. Um, I know that just having you in this space just makes us feel comfortable too and all of the team over at Arca. So thank you for everything that you guys are doing. That's awesome, Mark. Um, it's always a pleasure to be with you. It's really a pleasure to be on the show. Um, you reinforced our tagline, which is responsible innovation. Uh, we take it very seriously, and I hope that um, you know, we're not going to disappoint moving forward. So uh, we appreciate the kind words. We appreciate you know sharing our story with your viewers, and um, we can't wait to uh, see you soon. Thank you again, Mark. Absolutely. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Asset Revolution. We appreciate you listening to this edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. I'm your host, Mark Nichols. Please don't forget to let us know how you like the show by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. For more downloadable digital asset resources and educational opportunities, please visit us at arbordigital.io. We are here to help you get off zero safely and securely. Thanks again for tuning in and be sure to tell someone you care about them. Cheers. We are financial advisors. However, we are not your financial advisor. Unless you're under contract with or actively speaking with Arbor Capital Management or Arbor Digital, a division of Arbor Capital Management. This podcast is just that, a podcast. It is not financial, legal, or tax advice. If you have individual questions, please reach out.